It would be two years tomorrow, two years ago tomorrow actually, um, I was minding my own business and, and suddenly someone said, hey, uh, you might be interested in this job. And talked to me about it, actually the conversation started about six months before that, before I knew it, um, I said, yeah, I think I'd like to uh, play with radios all day long. <laughs> my wife tells a story. And once I started working for uh, Gwinnett County in this capacity, said, does John like his new job? She said, think about it. He plays with radios all day. What do you think? <laughs> so my position is I'm responsible for the uh, Gwinnett County radio communication system. Uh, we'll talk specifics about it, but it's an 800 megahertz uh, P25 digital uh, radio system. And I'll uh, try to acquaint you with uh, just about everything I can think of about it. And, uh, and then we have some, some show-and-tell radios here to show you what uh, people are actually using on this. Um, the radio system supports, we think of it first as of just supporting public safety, which is police, fire, uh, sheriff, and we also add in corrections, and, and then 911 is dispatched on there as well. But it really supports, uh, that's only part of the people that use the radio system. You've got all of the public works departments, which is just about everyone else from DOT, community services, parks is under that. Support services, the courts, when you see the deputies in the courtroom, they're all communicating uh, at GJAC with, uh, with radios as well. District Attorney Tax Assessor, uh, our Department of Water Resources. All of these people uh, use these radios. And then you have the cities. Every one of the cities uh, in the county, Lawrenceville, Snellville, Buford, Duluth, on and on and on, all of them use our system as well. So that's kind of the backbone for um, government-related communications. And then we have the outside agencies. Uh, when I say GNR Health, Gwinnett Newton Rockdale Health, George Gwinnett College, their uh, public safety officers uh, and their maintenance people even use our system. Gwinnett Tech. GBI, GSP, uh, the Georgia DOT, ATF, Emory University also. And then we also share um, the ability for people to come in, for example, to get, there's a lot of interaction on the, on the police side, especially between Gwinnett and DeKalb, that border down near Stone Mountain, et cetera. So we'll actually allow people from, uh, public safety users from DeKalb, like our SWAT team, to be able to come over and use our system as well, and, and vice versa. So all in all, it's about 8,000 radios all together, of which about um, 3,196 to be exact are public safety, and then another uh, 802 belong to all the other departments. I can't believe I remember all those numbers, but last year I had to just about remember everyone doing reports on this, that, and the other. So 8,000 radios are on this system at any one point, not at any one point, but they're also users. I got a call about six months ago uh, from, uh, he was my counterpart with uh, ATF, and he said, we're going to have this operation in your county here in about a month. Actually, I think he said it's about two weeks away. Mm -hmm. And I need to get all my 125 agents in the Atlanta area programmed on your system. And I went, what? <laughs> but uh, we got together on that. They did a joint operation with uh, uh, Gwinnett Police Sheriff and uh, all of our specialty units and um, really did some good things with that. But uh, that was kind of fun to... Uh, to be a part of that, getting that uh, ready as well. To give you a little history, if you go back, let's say prior to 1989, this looked like a ham repeater system. Uh, you had VHF and UHF FM repeaters that were located around the county. Um, you had uh, remote receivers. 
uh, just a, you know, a typical system like we operate today. It was FM, it was analog, but in 1989 things changed a little bit and we, the county went with what's called the Motorola SmartNet system. It was still analog, but it was a trunked radio system. It had seven sites and there were 18 simulcast channels. And I'll explain a little bit more about simulcast if you don't get that part of it. But I actually, uh, at one of our sites, I was out there today, and it's a pretty good sized room. And I wondered why this building was actually so big. And they said, well, this used to be what we call the master site. And I said, well, what all did you have in here? You all know what an MSF 5000 repeater looks like? There were 18 of those in there. And they would stack them up, put them back to back, and that was the Motorola SmartNet system based on an MSF 5000. Still 800 megahertz, but that was it. Come along about 2008, uh, you have what a, a standard was developed, had been developed over the past years called P25. I'll explain more about it. But in 2008, it was a pretty big transition to the P25 digital technology and it was called P25 Phase 1 FDMA, Frequency Division Multiple Access. We'll go into a little bit more detail on that. The next year they figured out, well there's some fringe areas right on the edges of the county and I'll show you the sites where three more additional sites were added. So we went from seven to ten. And then um, just this past year, uh, we've got all these uh, 4,000 radios that the county owns that are manufactured end-of-life support. That doesn't mean they die, it just means that the manufacturer, Motorola in this case, says, I can't guarantee that I'm going to have parts for these anymore. So we started a process of upgrading all of our, our uh, radios, and it'll be done over a two or three year period to what's called the Motorola APX series. It's digital radios, new technology, they got a lot of new whiz -bang features. The current technology, P25, it's also known as APCO 25, Project 25, it was really developed for interoperability. Boy, that's a nice buzzword that says everybody ought to be able to talk to everybody. In reality, it doesn't quite happen that way. But it does give you a common platform that you can do that with. We currently operate a Motorola Astro 25 system, and it's operating FDMA. Now, what's the difference in FDMA, you heard me, or did I even say the term TDMA, or Time Division Multiple Access? If you look at the top, um, the top little graphic there, FDMA is just like what we do. You've got one conversation on one frequency. Now, these are on 12 and a half kilohertz wide channels. But it's digital, but it's one conversation on one frequency. Someday, in the future, we'll go to what's called TDMA, or Time Division Multiple Access, and what that does, it says, I'm going to put two conversations on one RF carrier. Pretty neat stuff. And the way that works is you do time slots. So for the first few milliseconds, I'm going to transmit one conversation. The next few milliseconds, I'm going to come, I'm going to transmit another one, and I'm going to alternate back and forth. So I'm digitizing those into ones and zeros, and then I'm going to do that. We're not TDMA right now, but we are TDMA capable. We don't need to be TDMA. The primary thing that drives you for that is capacity. We've got plenty of capacity right now, but in the future, we'll probably need that. And channels are frequencies are assigned by coordinating bodies just like on ham radio except they're <laughs> thou shalt only use these frequencies not a volunteer method and they're getting very hard to find because everyone wants more and more we're fortunate that we got 18 channels way back when and nobody's going to take them away from us I mentioned the term simulcast technology have you heard of simulcast? It used to be uh, very prominent in paging, that you would have paging systems 
where you could have multiple transmitters on the same frequency at different sites. And the idea there is I can hear a much wider area with that. Now the key to simulcast is you have to have them all very precisely on the same frequency and you try to get the signals in phase so that you're not hearing like two carriers. What, what happens when we have two people that double? You hear a buzz, you hear a heterodyne, you hear something like that. Because we're not precisely on the same frequency. And our signals aren't timed to be in phase. So that's why <laughs> simulcast, even though you can do that in ham radio, it's rarely done, but commercially, it works pretty well. So we've got, and I'll go into to all the sites on that, but we use the 800 megahertz band. The 800 megahertz band went through some changes a few years ago. Uh, cellular started in the 800 megahertz band. They were using the frequencies of, uh, I think it was 809 to 824 on the low end, and then uh, I want to say it was 854 to 869, somewhere in there. And what you had was in the middle, well, below it and in the middle, you had some frequencies that were reserved for non-cellular applications. And you had a separate band for transmit and receive so that you can, it's full duplex, you can, you're transmitting while you're receiving. The problem was, somebody came along named Nextel. And Nextel said, I want, this is when we only had two cellular carriers. In this area, it was Bell South, and it made, it went from Pactel to this, that, and the other. I, I forget all the names that we went through. I, that was back in my cellular days. But you only had two cellular carriers. So somebody said they want to be the third guy. And what they did, they used what's called an ESMR, or Enhanced Specialized Mobile Radio. And they were all interlaced with the public safety frequencies that were used by government users. And there was chaos. There was interference. If you happen to be near an Nextel site, and that might overwhelm your receiver for public safety. The SEC, in its sometimes wisdom, said, we're going to do a thing called rebanding, and we're going to fix this problem. And what they did, they said, okay, we're going to reserve a section only for public safety, and then we're going to have another section over here for Nextel or anybody else operating like a trunked 800 megahertz system. We actually have two of those trunk-type carriers in the southeast, one of them being Nextel. Who's the other one? Southern Link. They built, Southern Link was kind of an interesting situation in that they built communications for all of the uh, southern company entities to use within there. Uh, George Power, Alabama Power, Gulf Power, all of those. And then they said, you know, we've got this extra capacity. Why don't we sell it like Southern? So they were doing that. So rebanding went through, and I'm glad I didn't have to go through that. We actually moved frequencies around, repacked them. And so now you have all of public safety in its own area of the spectrum. And that works out real well for uh, keeping interference because you're only basically controlling interference against yourself. So that works out pretty well. Now, here's the thing. Sandy said she misses being able to listen to police. Back a few years ago also, well, digital communications makes this very easy to do. You can encrypt it. And it is very highly encrypted. And in Gwinnett County, we encrypt um, police, fire, and sheriff. Uh, your uh, scanner will still work if you want to listen to DOT and parks and some of those folks, but not very interesting stuff there about the roadblock over on Hurricane Shoals. So it is encrypted. You cannot get any kind of scanner that will work. I think some people will probably claim they've, they've cracked the code and, and do that. You may be able to do that, but 
for 99.99% of the people out there, um, they, it is encrypted and you cannot receive public safety communications. Not all counties are using encrypted communications at this point. I think DeKalb doesn't encrypt everything at this point, but they're going that way. DeKalb's behind us, literally. You're, you're going to find that in some places that uh, they're, they're just not encrypted, it's open, and, and with the digital trunk tracking scanners, um, you can find out what they're doing. Um, talk about trunking. I said we're a trunked system. How does a trunking system work? I said we've got 18 channels. So in every site, I've got 18 transmitters and 18 transceivers. They actually happen to look like those boxes over on the left side. Those are Motorola GTR 8000 transceivers. They're a separate transmitter receiver. So I've got, in every site, I've got a rack with two racks of nine of those. And what they do, the transmit, transmitters are combined. Um, in, in our case, we've got three transmit antennas on every tower. So I combine six transmitters with a filter network and then they go feed a, a transmit antenna. On the receive side, there's two receive antennas. Each one comes down into a receiver multi-coupler, which is a, there's a tower top preamp mounted on the tower. Why do you mount it there? If you can preamplify as close to the receiving source as you can, your noise figure is a lot lower. So there's some really well-protected uh, tower top preamplifiers on the uh, mounted up actually up on the tower they come down uh, just to give you an example uh, it doesn't take as, as big a coax so to speak on the receive side as it does on the transmit because I'm feeding my power all the way up from the bottom in some cases up 800 feet up a tower but since I'm preamplifying up at the top of the tower I can bring it down on um, Seven eighths diameter line, as opposed to inch and five eighths going up. So it goes into the receiver multicoupler, and then it splits it out. This is kind of what we're talking about for field day and George Cuso party, where you feed a receive signal to each one of those receivers. Now, how does trunking fit into that? I said we've got eight thousand radios that use our system. Not everybody's going to be on there one time but they're all going to be making short transmissions. So what happens is you actually say, I'm going to, you're going to be a part of a talk group, and that might be fire dispatch, and I'll talk more about talk groups in a minute. But so if someone in that talk group transmits, the system says, all right, everybody will go over to channel one and listen. And so everybody in that talk group will go listen on channel one. Then once the conversation's over, and these are short, what we call dispatch type communication, short two or three second transmission. Then the channel will go idle, and then it's available to be assigned to another talk group. So 18 channels can support 125 different talk groups and 8,000 radios. And not a single one of them will be locked out busy where we are right now. Uh, okay, there's still a traffic analysis. Oh yeah, there's traffic analysis that goes with that. If somebody gets wordy, it could, you could be blocked by this. Well, I'm not going to mention the exact number <laughs> where we are right now in terms of system loading, but let's say the stuff hits the rotary oscillator in the county <laughs> somewhere. And there's a whole lot of stuff going on. You've got police responding, you've got fire responding, EMS, you've got DOT, you've got all these things happening. There's going to be a lot more traffic on the system. But so you want to make sure you have that headroom in there that when you're t when more of these talk groups are active and they're getting assigned here, dropped here, moved over here, that you've got channels to support. And I can tell you for at least the two years that I've been uh, associated with this, we haven't had one single busy, as they call it. Uh, I assume there's some sort of hierarchy where somebody will get pros out, you know, you'll... No, actually there isn't. Oh. 
Y'all didn't hear the question. Uh, Steve was asking, is there some kind of hierarchy or prioritization? Um, actually, no. But we do have that capability if we, if we needed to do that. So that's kind of the short version of trunking. Simulcast. Talked about that. If you look on the receive side, every, remember I said every site is listening to the same 18 frequencies. 18 receive, 18 transmit. On the receive side, they all come back to what's called a comparator. We know those things as voters on the digital side. And it picks the best signal. It can actually pick more than one signal. Uh, because on average, I know this from a statistic I see every month, any radio is normally received by at least two sites because of the spacing of sites and the height of the antennas and all of that good stuff. So between two to three sites hear every signal transmitted. And so it comes back to the comparator, voter in our terms, and it picks the best signal. On the transmit side, it's a little bit different story. We feed the same signal that's being repeated back out to all 10 sites. We time those where that they're all in phase. All the transmit um, oscillators are, are synced to a GPS clock. So it's like you have a very precise frequency standard for those. And so you are actually receiving the signal when you're listening to something active. You're listening to two or three transmitters. And you wouldn't know it. It's just one. Are they using delay lines in each path? Uh, it's uh, digital delays. Not delay lines, digital, digital delays. delays and so that you time them out. Because it's a lot longer to go all the way up to Buford Dam Road than it is to go over to the site on the south side of Lawrenceville. And is it time so they reach the transmitter at the same time? Yes. Or, okay, so it's yes. Not, you don't play games in between sites checking this is also no. play there. No, you're, you're timing them out where uh, it takes the, the signal receipt, the signal makes it to every transmitter at the same time. It's delayed to a close site and you take the farthest away site and say, okay, it's going to take X microseconds to get there. So that's, that's what simulcast is. And that's a very efficient way of doing things because I don't have to worry about frequency planning between the sites. I have the same 18 that go into the same 18 combiners, the same multi-couplers, all that. Just to give you a few fun facts, I said 10 radio sites. And then we have what's called a master prime site. It's actually master and prime. They have different functions. But the radio sites, uh, and I'll show you a map of them where they're located around the county, uh, are on towers. Um, the shortest one we have, well, it's actually not even a radio site. I guess the shortest tower we've got is about 150 feet tall. The tallest is 800 feet tall. We have an 800, a 600, a 450 self-supporter. Imagine that. Uh, it's a long way between legs on the ground on that one. Um, all the way down to 150 feet. All of our sites are linked together, and I'll show you a map by microwave. And one of the main reasons that we do that is I don't want to depend on telephone lines, DSL lines, fiber, to be able to be interrupted. So I'm totally disconnected from the public infrastructure. And we do protections within that to make it as reliable as we can. Actually, our microwave was in the same shape as some of these radios. They had reached end of life before I got there. They tell the story about they had a microwave outage one night. They didn't have a particular cart, but they found it on eBay, <laughs> and they bought it. So the project I had in the fourth quarter of this year was we replaced our entire microwave system, upgraded. It's all digital microwave. 
uh, all but one link. One link is six gigahertz microwave. They're 30 megahertz channels. It's um, right now it's kind of a hybrid of T1 based and IP based for Ethernet. But we're converting it to Ethernet this year, so everything will be like a computer network until it gets to your ear. Um, 18 digital simulcast voice channels, talked about that. 125 different talk groups. Now each one of those talk groups is going to be like Fire Dispatch, Fire Tac 2, um, West Precinct for Police, DOT Road Crew 1, um, Jail Ops. There's 125 of those on the system. And remember each one of those when you look at it in a radio, you're tuning a talk group like you tune a channel. You're not going to a frequency. What you're going to is say, I am on talk group 80027. And so I'll explain how, how that works. But each one of those, you know, I can set up talk groups all day long so that uh, I can put a group together, Sheriff's Department, asked me to, to do a, a new talk group for them, for a, a new group of about five deputies that they had. Mark? Are all 125 talk groups in use, or is there some like that for future expansion? You just have them there, you can use them as needed, or are they all in use at one time? Well, with the exception of some that I just haven't come through them all, and you know, there might be five or ten that really don't get used anymore, uh, but all 20, 125 of those are real. Um, I just added some for police. I added 12 new talk groups. They wanted, they had a great idea. Don't know why I hadn't done it before. There's six training talk groups. One assigned to each one of our five precincts, and we're about to have a sixth precinct over in uh, the Bay Creek area in the next year. And so they assigned, the when they do training, they can take everybody that's involved in that training, get them off a regular talk group, and put them over on that. We also created event, six event talk groups. Those are for things like when they're working the fair and they need to be off the regular talk groups and they can talk among there. Uh, those talk groups, uh, there's 12 of them that we put together, event one through six and training one through six. But yeah, all 125 are basically valid talk groups. And as I said earlier, all the public safety talk groups are encrypted. Here's where our sites are. If you look at the red sites, those are the original seven. Uh, you've got the site that was, the closest one here is the one just south of uh, downtown Lawrenceville, uh, right off of New Hope Road, and then all the way out to, uh, that is Trimble Mill. That's a 600 foot tower on Chandler Road on the backside of Trimble Mill Park. Uh, this one is Snellville, uh, we call it Lanier Mountain. Um, that always fascinated me that we have a mountain. It's actually that, that highest point over as you uh, go into Snellville and go on down 78 going toward the mountain. On the left side you'll see a big red and white 450 foot self-supporting tower. And then there are two or three cellular towers right nearby. That's obviously <laughs> right around there. So that's that side. This is uh, the one we've probably, you've probably heard about Goshen. We call it Goshen Springs. It's, uh, remember where the old water tanks were that said when it is great? Well, that's a, how big is that tower? 400. No, it's about 400 feet. 400 foot self supporting tower right there uh, between Jimmy Carter and Indian Trail. Um, and. You'll also notice that uh, a couple of these sites are also guard sites. Um, we have a remote receiver on the Goshen site and also the 442100, the reason it gets out so well, it's on that tower. Triple Mill, we've got a new remote receiver there. And then if I go on up, this is Brown Road, uh, right there by Sugarloaf Mills. Uh, that big, I can't think how tall that one is, it's about 400 feet, I think, uh, self-supporter there that um, right there at Sugarloaf in 85, right behind the Hampton Inn, I think it is. Right. Um, 
wonderful sight. It's on high ground to begin with. It is high ground to begin with because I can stand on the ground and see pretty far down Stone Mountain. Then up north, this one is up on Buford Dam Road. Uh, and this one is over, this is our 800 foot beauty that we call Togo Road. Y'all know where the Phillips Prison is, uh, north of Hamilton Mill, uh, right up in that area. The tower actually sits in a hole. So it's 800 feet tall, but about the first 100 feet are in a hole. So it's effectively, but it was on county property there, so they already owned that, so it was a great place to put it. Maybe they'll sell it cheap? <laughs> no. <laughs> the three yellow sites are those three I said were expanded in 2009. This one is right down, we call it Norris Lake. If you go down 124 south of Centerville, just before you cross into beautiful DeKalb County. This one is, um, we call it Crooked Creek. It's, uh, if you're going on Holcomb Bridge, just before you cross into Fulton County, there's a water treatment plant. Actually, I think it's a sewer plant, sewage plant. It's right there off to the left on Plant Drive. And we have a, a about a 150 foot tower right there. Now, what's the story of this one up here? It looks like it's not in the county. It's not. Uh, it's actually on Forsyth County Fire Station 10. It's one of their sites. But these three sites, while these are all omnidirectional, these are directional antennas that point back into the county. <coughs> This one actually is located just outside the county, but the idea was to be able to enhance the coverage along the Chattahoochee Basin. I assume we're paying rent to them. We are. Um, no, actually we're not. Um, we, we do a cooperative agreement there. Um, I'm trying to think we have anybody other than the cellular companies on our tower, but I don't think that's true. But it was some kind of a cooperative agreement there for that. So those are our sites. The green one is our master prime site. You've seen that antenna sitting right behind police headquarters right across 316. A nice little 150 foot, freshly painted tower with new LED tower lights on it, proud of that. Uh, and that's where everything comes back to. Kyle? Uh, you mentioned the 442100 is at Go Goshen. Um, can you point out where the other GARS uh, sites are? Yeah, I said that uh, Trouble Mill has a new receiver. Okay. That, these two hear about everything in the world. If, uh, if, you, if for those of, that are involved with repeaters, you'll know that these two pick up just about everything, and they both hear about the same thing. Uh, when David was putting this side of the air, I was over there with him, and Rick was driving into work uh, down at CDC, and he was all the way over here and we were listening to him full quieting while he was mobile right over here. And, so, and actually, he got all the way down, probably close to Claremont, before he started fluttering. So this site does real well. We've got another site that's coming on soon. Uh, everything's in place except this uh, bad jumper at the top of the tower uh, for the Togo Road site that is uh, 755 feet up that 800 foot tower. What about so, our 220? 220 is also a good point. 220 is over at the Triple Mill site. Uh, it's at about two, is it 200 feet, David? Uh, 220 is at 200 feet? 191. Yeah. And then uh, we have a remote receiver at 200. two, it's a little over there, I think it's 247. Yeah. So these three are going to be remote receiver sites fully operational. I don't think we can do much better than that, so that works out very well. So that's where the sites are. This is our master prime site. Everything comes back here. This is the brains. You know, once it, it turns into a radio, it becomes a computer network. Every, every device in here has an IP address. And it's everything in there is switches and routers and servers. So that's the system. Here's our microwave network, brand new, shiny. Um, you'll notice a couple of things about this. When we originally had this, it was just this ring. Now, key thing about a ring is uh, you've got some redundancy built in. If I break this path right here, I can go around the other way and get to this site. 
So I've got built-in redundancy. And then when we added the three sites, we added some protected spur paths down to these. So if I get a radio failure here, I've got a backup radio that can pick it back up. So those three sites. Now, what's this red line in the middle? When we built the microwave system this year, uh, just a few months ago, we added a new path from our master prime site police headquarters back over to the Brown Road site over next to Sugarloaf Mills. Did that for a couple of reasons. In 2019, I'm going to have installed a, what we call a geodiverse prime. What that means is I'm going to have a backup prime site over there <coughs> to be redundant brains for the system. So I want to have a nice high capacity link between those. But the added benefit was we also broke this into two rings. So two rings are better than one ring. So I could lose this right here, and I haven't done anything up here. But I still have two rings in place for traffic to go both directions. So since I, I don't want to, uh, I'm not connected to fiber, can't have any backhoe fades from digging over on some lonesome street. Um, We've got a, a nice redundancy built into the microwave network. Um, I, I mentioned this is all six gigahertz microwave, except for this one little path here. It's half a mile long that goes between uh, police headquarters and the jail. And the reason we have that is they have consoles over there where they dispatch their own people. So I needed a data link to go over to the jail. So they've got their own console to dispatch their people. Er, is that 12 gig? It's 18 gig. So that does fade. In a half mile, it's going to take, we're going to be looking for the arc if it's going to fade. <laughs> we got a half mile path at 18 gig, and I'm trying to think what the EIRP is on there. It's probably the transmitters on there, I know, are about one watt. Okay, and then they go into a high gain antenna that's about a 30 dBi gain antenna. So. Doing 30 gig with uh, 13 and a half. Yeah, yeah, that's even bigger. Yeah, these are just that's a four foot antenna. On these, these are all six foot antennas for all of those. Kirk, you have a question? Yeah, how does weather affect that microwave? I know it used to just wipe out since so not six gig. Not six. Uh, six is low enough in frequency that it's really not going to bother it. What would probably bother it more than anything if I had a lot of icing on those um, but being as they are uh, you know a dish like this as opposed to what Steve deals with with a satellite dish would collect all that uh, you know it doesn't take much at all for that ice to start falling off but there's enough gain on those antennas that it, it's not bad at all but yeah six is very very reliable and these are short paths I think the longest path I've got is six or seven miles some of them are three or four miles. I was looking, because I had uh, tower work going on here today, and it's a guide tower, so they had to worry about, they were, T-Mobile uh, has some stuff on that tower, and they had to add new guy wires on there, and torque arm, which a torque arm will twist the tower. It's also how you keep it from twisting, because you have two guy wires coming down. So they were concerned that when they started tensioning those guy wires, would they twist the tower to the point where it would affect my microwave? So having just gone through the training on the microwave, brought my laptop out, hooked up to it, and said, oh, I've got a NIC 29 signal. It's supposed to be NIC 29 and a half. We're still okay. So <coughs> those are short paths. That's a four, that's a three mile path, that's a four mile path. So very short. Any questions on that? Those channels are 30 megahertz wide. Right now they're divided up because we still have a little bit of the older technology that the sites use T1s, but we're converting that. There's a the total payload on there is 189 megabits on each one of those sites. Uh, that's not a lot when we think about, you know, you've got better service than that probably at home on your internet service. But uh, that's going to allow me to do some things that I'll basically have an ethernet network there to play with, put cameras or something like that on it as well. All right, let's talk about these uh, cheap radios. 
the uh, the main one that has been the workhorse of uh, at least the public safety side is this one down in the lower corner here with the bad antenna on it. I just noticed that. Um, actually, the antenna is good; it just doesn't have its protective cover over it. Uh, this is a Motorola XTS 5000 portable. Um, every police officer, um, every sheriff deputy. Um, fire does it a little bit different. They assign them, like I may have three on an engine, um, five in the dedicated to a battalion, and on and on and on like that. They just do it differently. But this has been the workhorse. Um, this is heavy. It also costs a lot of money. Um, I'm going to pass this around. Sure, I get it back. See how heavy it is. How much money? <coughs> uh, that radio, brand new, cost about four thousand dollars. For tax dollars, it worked. <laughs> but they were reliable, and we started purchasing those. I understand in two thousand four. Uh, they were sold by Motorola up until two thousand eleven. They go end of life support at the end of this year. Um, but I've got a whole bunch of spares because I just converted about eight. Uh, 700 radios I took out of service of that type and replaced them with the new type I'll show you. So I've got a bunch of spares. You know, if uh, what happens occasionally, some of them will sit one on the back of a fire engine, forget it's there, roll back over it, and they survive pretty well, but sometimes they don't do real well either. I should have brought some of them that, uh, where's Bruce? There you are. Bruce handles the uh, the radios over in uh, in fire department, and uh, he tells me stories about some of those as well. But that's uh, that's the primary radio used for public safety. The uh, mobile version of that is an XTL 5000. That's this radio. It's a mobile. Um, it's about the same price. Uh, and they've been in service about the same time. These are 800 megahertz digital radios. They will not operate TDMA, but they will operate FDMA, so a single conversation on a single frequency. I'll start these over on this side. Don't let this fall on your foot. It's very heavy. <laughs> um, John, I'm assuming that you're using there's a control channel that tells the mobiles what to do and what you know when to do it. I'll go over that in just a second. All right, the non-public safety groups used a lesser version of this called the XTS 2500. It's a little smaller, weighs about the same amount, costs almost as much. I think these were about. I'm gonna get. I, I think they were around thirty-five hundred dollars. So real bargain. Uh, so you have that, and the mobiles look just about the same. Those are not going into life until the end of next year. But starting uh, about four months ago, we started purchasing our first batch of these. This is a whiz-bang radio. It's called the APX 6000. Actually, this is a 6000 Lite. Um, they make versions of this that will do... Uh, VHF, UHF, and 800 megahertz in the same radio. This one just does 800 megahertz. They will also do TDMA. And we actually use these because our SWAT guys got these. We got all our specialized units uh, equipped with these before end of the year. And they went down to the Mercedes-Benz Stadium for the National Championship game. Uh, also for the SEC Championship or everything else down there. And the Atlanta system has some TDMA channels. So seamlessly, they would go down. We had it programmed in. They could get on the Atlanta system and operate just fine. Uh, so these are really, really neat. Um, this is actually a little bit cheaper than that one I'm passing around. It's, uh, it's about $3,600. Not a lot more. I'll start this one here. Give me that one back for sure, because it's a lot of money. So, so John, Baofeng doesn't make any? Baofeng and the Chinese do not 
make any of these. However, you know, part of that's a, that's a good question in that um, the P25 standard is, I won't call it an open standard, but it is a standard standard. And so uh, you can be, you can license the P25 technology and other manufacturers will actually make radios for these. Motorola in this country has the vast majority of the business, uh, but you have Harris, you have Tate, uh, which I think is a British uh, company. They're Australian, Tate is Australian, and some others out there. Uh, Kenwood actually uh, makes, a, they bought EF Johnson, and so they make some P25 radios as well. But uh, that is a great little radio. Um, the APX series, we began upgrading those. I'm just about to place an order for another 1,244, I think. They're both capable in the 700 and 800 megahertz band. Oh, it's the first time I've mentioned 700, right? Uh, 700 is kind of the expansion of the 800 megahertz public safety band. You know how our UHF TV channel started going away? Well, they were up in 800 and now they're down to 700 and there's even some 600 megahertz spectrum that's coming available because all the UHF, I think, the, what's the top UHF channel now? Something like channel 36 or something like that. We used to have 83. Uh, these are, they've got everything in the world in them. They've got GPS, which we will be using. We don't have the capability to do it right now, but right now an officer in their car, we know where those cars are because they have uh, something in there with GPS. These radios, the APX series going around, has GPS in it, so when an officer goes on foot, we'll know where they are. They're also Bluetooth cable. They make some Bluetooth accessories. So you can have a, a Bluetooth microphone. Um, police don't usually like those real well because what if they lose their microphone? Uh, what am I gonna use? So most of them I didn't bring in with me, but. They've got, you'll see most police officers have a public, what they call a public safety microphone. They've got it on their belt. They've got a little cord that comes up to a microphone up here with a little short stubby antenna on it. And the reason police do that, now think about how a policeman, what do they do most of the day? And I don't want any donut stories around here. <laughs> They're in their car. Their portable is their primary radio. Even though they have a mobile in there, it's, it's too easy to reach up here and talk. So what they do, sitting in the car, think of where that radio is on their belt. It's down below the door level. It's encased in metal. So this public safety microphone hits the antenna up here. Now probably another 20 years you're going to see police officers with a big ear. Some, some radio signal. But right now, uh, that gets it up when they're sitting in their vehicle up around window level. So that works out real well. Firemen, you won't see them, they use a different microphone that doesn't have the antenna on it because firemen, at least in our fire department, most of them don't have the radio when they're in a vehicle. When they have, you have like an engine, they'll have three radios that are assigned to the three people in that engine when they go on scene. They'll grab, and it's A, B, and C. It's it, you know who's getting that radio. The driver gets A, et cetera, et cetera. So they will either wear them on their ear up here, or they're not really in their car as much, vehicle. They, they don't have that radio when they're in the engine or the truck or whatever, ladder truck, whatever. So. Their public safety, their microphones, speaker mics, don't have an antenna on them. But most of them are wearing, when you see them in their full fire gear, that's, it's usually right up here. Or like the hazmat people, that's all contained within their suit. They have special uh, connections to be able to work that radio. So then to say Wi-Fi, why do they need Wi-Fi? No, they're not Googling on here. The Wi-Fi is so we can remotely program it. Uh, we don't have the capability in place right now, but if that radio went into a police precinct, I could, in theory, I could say, hey, whenever that hits one of our county hotspots, uh, 
reprogram that radio and add this to it. So those are the ways that you can do that. They're smaller, longer battery life, um, and it's just got a whole lot of new capabilities. What power are they running? They're running two watts, two watts max. And the mobiles? The mobiles are, I think, five watts. Really not that much. But the antennas on the outside of the car, you know, we've got 10 receivers all around the county. Uh, but still, there's still some in-building coverage, and this especially affects fire. They go into the bowels of a building, there can still be some dead spots. Hey, John. Yeah. Do they have talk around? The they do have talk around. Uh, talk around is simplex to us. Um, we, there was an active shooter exercise, some of you may even participate in it, back a year or so ago up in Mall of Georgia. We got some volunteers or people run around and act like they got shot. And um, inside the Mall of Georgia, there's some places radios don't work through the system. Dead spots. You're going to have that. You can never eliminate all of them. Fire went to talk around, simplex among their own radios, and they could still talk to each other and communicate back to a command point. So do all of these radios, are there all of them capable of covering all 125 channels? Yes. No. No. I understood what you were saying. Um, police radios have a certain group of talk groups. Uh, they're organized into zones, and a zone can have 16 talk groups. So, for example, zone one in every police radio is District 1, TAC 1, District 2, TAC 2. Those are different precincts and associated tactical channel. And then you've got, I think, all DPS, which is all Department of Public Safety in all county. Two is going to be training one through six and event one through six. C are the cities. So, they're all organized the same. Now, that hadn't always been the case. That's a very good question. When I first started looking at these radios, if I pulled 100 radios, I would find 95 of them programmed differently. So what we tried to do, working with police, fire, and, and sheriff's department, is standardize. There's four configurations for any of the new police radios right now. There's really, there's really two and a half, I'll call it, because one of them is called standard, and one's called command. If you're a lieutenant or above, you get a command set of talk groups. If you're below, if you're corporal and below, you get one. You stand it. Okay. You, you mentioned with a fire when uh, they're going into the bowels of a building that uh, sometimes they can't be heard by your repeater system. Uh, any thoughts on maybe making like a cross down repeater on the fire truck to? Uh, you know, get the signal back out to the network? Uh, there isn't anything in place for that right now, but we are looking at options. Um, just like cellular, you can have, you know what a cow is? Yeah. You know what a colt is? You know what a pig is? I'm making that up. <laughs> um, <laughs> cows are cell on wheels, colts are cell on light trucks, and there's another version, but I made up the pig. Um, so, I mean, we're looking at some options on that. Including the drone-mounted one? <laughs> there might be even a drone-mounted one. But right now, we don't have that capability. But, yes, I mean, we could borrow some good ideas from ham radio operations. As well. All right, so that's what we're doing. Hey, John. Yes? Can, can they do any type of uh, crossband repeat, like from the radio through their mobile? No. No, we don't have that capability. But um, I can tell you this. I've gotten to meet my counterparts in all the other uh, jurisdictions, counties, and we meet quarterly, and I hear about their woes. And I can tell you that the Gwinnett County system probably has about the best coverage. Now, understand, City of Atlanta is going to have its challenges. You know, you get in the concrete canyons, but 800 megahertz is going to bounce around a lot, too. So, um, you know, everybody, everyone has its challenges, but our system does extremely well. It's extremely light loaded in those terms. So, I mean, when they press the button, they're going to get a, they're going to get a channel. Here's how it works. That was a question you had a minute ago. There is a control channel. When you're not talking and you just turn on a radio, 
you are tuned to that designated control channel. That's it's a, one of the 18? One of the 18. It is, well, it's all purely data if you can listen to the RF on it. But that is strictly data. And when someone, well, first to find a talk group is a grouping of radios. I mentioned that, like Fire Dispatch, Police West Precinct, Duluth Dispatch, Fire Tac 2, um, DOT Road 2, any of those. So that talk group is not a channel, but you tune it in the radio just like a channel. And so when you're assigned to that talk group, it is listening to that control channel, and, and if someone wants to talk on that, the system then says, ah, we need to get all those radios over on one of our 18, 17 channels. And so the radio is instructed by the control channel, everybody on fire dispatch move to channel six. And it happens in a flash. And they listen there. They carry on a conversation. Remember, these are short transmissions, usually three or four seconds. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, another type of system is DMR. Uh, the, the Motorola proprietary add-ons to that are called Moto Turbo. Uh, I call Moto Turbo pure, uh, poor man's P25. You'll see some of the smaller counties like Jackson County has a Moto Turbo system. It's a trunk system, but it uses a different technology. It's not compatible directly with P25. But we brought DMR over into amateur radio. But you've got to think about these trunk systems are geared toward short dispatch type transmissions. And so that's where you see people, especially on like DMR, that come from a Motorola shop background. Those were the guys that originally got on it. They really got excited about that good thing. When somebody started carrying on a long QSO, they would have a duck. They'd say, you need to go somewhere else. So that was kind of a learning curve that once DMR came over into amateur radio that people had to kind of adjust to. Um, P25 has been brought into amateur radio. So there's actually, I know there's one P25 repeater in the Atlanta area. I don't know if anybody, one person that's on it. That's all. So you're assigned a radio channel to a talk group. All the radios tune over there. You talk, you talk, you talk. After a period of four to seven seconds of idle, the radios retune back to the control channel and listen for their next instruction. If I look at, I wish I could have done it from here, if I look at uh, what's called a zone watch screen, you would see those channels just light up as this is this, now it's this. Oh, channel three went back, it's now something different. You would just see those popping up and down. So that's the way that looks. Here's kind of kind of a graphic representation of it. If I frequency four, if if that's a talk group gets assigned to frequency four, see I could have this vehicle assigned to it listening to that frequency. I could have a fire vehicle assigned to it. Uh, now once that's over, it's going to be they'll go away from there and they'll tune back to a contr designated control channel. But that's how you can share, I can put all those radios on just a few channels, because they're short. The majority of the time, about <coughs> half or more of the channels are idle, because transmissions are quick. At any one point, there might be six to eight channels being assigned at that point in time. Next second, there'll be another six to eight. So how long that when you press the button before you're actually being heard, what's the delay? Milliseconds. It's fast. Now it's some radios tone. some radios are programmed with what's called a talk permit tone. Um, our public safety people don't really like the public but the uh, talk permit tone. I personally like it because it says I hit it. I got a talk group, I got a channel, I got a sign to that. But for some reason, our folks don't like that, and they just trust that they're going to get it. I guess they're spoiled that they they get it, get a good signal in most of the time. But you'll hear that. Uh, that's another thing you'll hear on DMR. You can have a talk permit tone, which means 
And remember, your radio is transmitting and receiving at the same time. So when you transmit, it's listening for other instructions. Now that doesn't happen as much on FDMA, but on TDMA, it happens because you can alternate time slots. I can transmit on one time slot, receive on another. To the, to the user in the radio, it looks like I'm talking and listening at the same time. But that's how trunking works. Uh, just a few little system stats. Um, if something's originated by the 911 console, we'll have about half a million of those every month. Saying 553, code 4. On the radio side, it's twice as many because they're talking to each other as well. There will be a million transmissions, a million times someone pushes that button during a month. Uh, would you have thought that the busiest day of the week is Wednesday? Would you have thought that that's Wednesday at 3 p.m. in the afternoon? Certainly surprised me as well. And as I said earlier, over half the calls are heard by three radio sites at any one time. Hey, John. Mm-hmm. On those stats, that's just voice traffic or voice and data? Well, it's all data, yeah, well, but it's voice <laughs> as data. But is there any data as data? No. So that's separate. There actually is a capability on that, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we're pretty much out of time. Um, in a public safety vehicle, whether it be a fire engine or a police vehicle, you'll see they've got a computer sitting there. It's a laptop dock. They're not called laptops. In public safety, they're called MDTs, mobile data terminals. And that's actually connected over cellular, a cellular modem. So, because the speed that they can get is a lot faster than what we can send over this. Because they're getting maps. They're getting, you know, if a fire engine goes to a location, they know a whole lot about that location before they even arrive. Can it fail over to your system if the cellular is out in a given area? We used to have that capability, but we did, that's been discontinued before I started because they, they need such speed, the need for speed, that uh, they, they, they would get spoiled. I mean, it would drop back down seriously slower data compared to what they can do. Um, really? Um, not, not quite dialogue. Um, UASI, you may hear this term. Urban Area Security Initiative. This is a federally funded program. Uh, the Atlanta metro area is involved in that. There's money that, that comes in for high threat, high density urban areas for funding security projects. We're one of six jurisdictions that participates in UASI. Um, the main benefit we got from it is we actually connect our P25 Gwinnett radio system to other systems. So if you had a large scale event in the metro Atlanta area, something's going on downtown, something's going on in Swanee, they can be all connected together on certain talk groups. It's set up for that. First responders are being linked across the systems. Uh, we also use that during the football championship. I guarantee you because the Super Bowl coming up next year is a city-wide event, uh, it'll really get some use there. So that's basically it. Um, Y'all been good about asking questions anymore? Yeah, uh, Any more questions? Bring me up radios. Well, uh, communications. <laughs> Oh, there's a good one. Thank I've been you. reading a lot of the uh, IEEE publications about LTE for public service. Yes. Steve's question is uh, LTE for public safety. Well, right now, when I mention this, these police vehicles and fire engines and all of that, they're on the cellular LTE network. But on the standard LTE. All right. What has happened? The Fed said, we want to create a... 700 megahertz nationwide network, data network, broadband network for first responders. So they said, okay, we're going to take proposals to be a nationwide carrier. AT&T wanted. Uh, and AT&T was smart in this way. They said, even though 
the FCC set aside a, 700, a 20 megahertz, 700, 20 megahertz, 700 megahertz frequency band in set aside strictly for public safety and first responders. AT&T said, we're going to up that one more. We'll give you, we'll make our whole network available. Now, only AT&T can use that what's called band 14, that 700 megahertz public safety first responder spectrum. But what they're doing is they're saying, all right, first responders, you get on our network, you get these exclusive frequencies over here, but you also get our regular, just like anybody else. But in the event of emergency, there's a thing called priority and preemption. Steve's going to get bumped off, but fire engine, fire station 14 is going to be sailing right along on data. And so they're going to get priority. Now, is it really going to ever get to that point that they need to preempt uh, folks? Maybe. Um, if it's a severe enough issue, it might happen. Question. But that's been created. It's called FirstNet. Uh, if, if you get a preemption uh, it's something like that, uh, will the other networks be uh, affected or is it just at and uh, The other networks would not be. This is only the AT&T network. I mean, so they'll only preempt you on those frequencies. Well, no. They, they're, what they're going to do... They'll preempt their whole network in the affected area? If it hit the rotary oscillator, they would first pre well, first responders are going to get that band 14 spectrum, that 20 megahertz, and they're going to use it first. If they outstrip the capacity of that, then they're going to start using the regular spectrum as well. And that's where you'll get preempted uh, and deprioritized. So that's first now. Any other questions? How? I guess I was curious if um, the, the way y'all monitor the radio traffic, what's what's the biggest um, uh, outage as far as if cellular or landlines or something and then radio traffic spikes to accommodate that? Um, have y'all seen any of that? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. Where the radio usage does go way up because, you know, the calls that they would normally make over cellular phone, track to a precinct or something, you know, then they have to do it over radio? Um, well, I mean, you even with FirstNet and AT&T says, oh, we're going to be the most reliable thing you've ever seen. Um, one of those backhoe phase where a major fiber line gets cut, um, yeah, you can experience some outages. Um, you're going to revert to voice traffic, probably. You know, it, it's like some of the stuff we do in, in uh, amateur radio communications, especially with Aries. You know, voice traffic's never going to go away. And, and pr that's going to be your primary thing. I mean, with all these signal codes and 10 codes and all this stuff that police have. I mean, they're so used to that. They can communicate a mouthful. And sometimes I don't see how these dispatchers can hear it. Because they'll have a shoulder mic here and they'll be talking over here. And uh, these dispatchers are good. Uh, I don't see how they do it. But yeah, yeah, you could have that situation happen. We got a radio on every school bus too, right? There are well, that's another story. Yes, there are radios on the school buses. The Gwinnett County Public Schools is on a totally separate system. It's on a UHF digital trunked LMR system. It's a single site located at my Brown Road Tower, but sure enough, right in the middle of the county. And they've got about five antennas on that tower, but it's a single Kenwood. UHF, digital, LMR system, land mobile radio. But it's totally separate. When's the hostile takeover? <laughs> I'm not going to get into the politics of that. So the county basically duplicated two radio systems. Yeah. You said at one time that like 99.99% .99 of people couldn't get in to hear the traffic, which implied that somebody could. If your encryption was compromised, can you push out new encryption to your radios, or do you have to bring them all in? Um, I can't change the encryption key on them, uh, like in mass, but they can go clear if they needed to. 
I mean, if you had something that they needed to go clear, I mean, they're not going to announce on WSB, hey, go ahead, just went clear. <laughs> Turn off your scanners. Um, but, you know, that could happen there as well. Any other questions? You're going to hear something here that uh, your scanners aren't working, so you're going to hear it right here. So, I mean, that's that's your short transmission right there. That's one of the police districts. Sorry, ready to go. That's a 1427. 171019. We'll kill the address. <laughs> um, but that was a, you said SO something, that's a sheriff. Um, these dispatchers are good. I don't see how they do it. I, I'll sit and watch them. Now, some of them, what I've noticed also, is if I hear them cutting off, they're, they're, they got a foot switch. Sometimes they'll start talking before they hit the foot switch. We've never done that as hams, have we? All right. And then you have officers, who, they'll do the same thing, and or they'll talk over here, and their mic's over here. All right. They, you mentioned WSB. I'm just curious. Do the uh, TV stations monitor your encrypted? No, they can't. No, they can. Uh, well, now remember I said uh, the cab is not encrypted. I don't think at this point on public safety, so they could hear them. But most of what they're 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 getting their information another way. Twitter. Yeah, they don't have a cray that will run all the encryption. All they need is a quantum dot computer. Same. Inaugurations, the last two that we had at the I listened to the fire and EMS dispatch in Washington. It was very, very interesting. Very interesting. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, I, I don't sit around listening to a radio all day unless I, and, and when I do listen, I'm listening because somebody said, hey, there, somebody's cutting out on uh, West Precinct. And so I'm really not listening for content, and I, there are very strict restrictions uh, on that information as well. Uh, even though I can listen to it for quality purposes and all of that, uh, I don't have the GCIC certifications to really go in and, and do anything with that. I listened every day until April 1st, 2015, when I woke up that day it was encrypted. And I thought it was a joke because it was April 1st. <laughs> and I had to get a job nine days later because I was losing my mind. <laughs> no. So, uh, Gwinnett County going encrypted helped the Gwinnett economy. Yes. Your, your yes. personal right. <laughs> How mentioned something a minute ago. Um, is this system 100% reliable? No. No. Uh, there could be things that happen. Uh, October 20, what would it have been? 15. Um, about four or five months before I started. Let's be clear about that. <laughs> uh, Aries got called out. Um, it wasn't that the system was down, it's dispatchers could not, I'm more comfortable over here, Tom. <laughs> dispatchers could not, from their consoles, talk on the radio. Now, the simple solution, and I don't know why they didn't do this, was every dispatcher's got a radio, portable radio, sitting on their desk. Pick up the doggone radio and start talking. But they called out Aries. And Aries was more than happy to respond and showed that we could dispatch and or not dispatch, but be dispatched to locations and be on the scene, be ready to communicate. Unfortunately everything came back before we had fast traffic. Uh, so we were hundred percent that day. Um, could something happen? Yeah. I'm definitely gonna be in Pucker mode when it does, but um, sooner or later something will happen. Bruce? Is that when they also went to MDT for backup? The 
that when they went to MVPs also? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's another point there. Um, the cellular network was still up. The problem was, and, I've, and it's been difficult for me to get a straight answer what happened that day, but it was a self-inflicted problem. Somebody loaded some new firmware on a switch. It went down, and somebody went, oh, you got to restore that. And then it came back about an hour later. Um, yeah, I mean, if you lose voice, um, you could... A lot of communications goes on to their MDTs between the dispatcher and the MDT. Like they're actually, they may say, you know, burglary and 10 codes at 1234 Atme Street, but they're also getting that on their MDT at the same time. So you've got some redundancy there as well. You know, the whole idea is that you want to be able to uh, get first responders as much information as you can as quickly as you can. I don't know. I couldn't answer that. Norm? At one time, we were told that we were going to stop using TIN codes or other codes so that everyone could understand everyone. That didn't happen, right? The National Incident Management System, NIMS, um, ARIES and all first responders have to have some training on NIMS. You take these ICS course, Incident Command System. Almost every first responder is required to take ICS 100 and 700. What NIM says is, thou shalt communicate in plain language. Do first responders do that? Now, in a situation where you have other people involved, uh, not just your standard responses, you know, people will probably revert back to that, but you're still going to have dispatchers that are going to be talking to them in, in signal codes, 10 codes. Um, I had to learn what code 4 was. I heard code 4 all the time. You know what code 4 is? Are you okay? Everything. That's, that's what that means. Everything's okay. And they, uh, you know, you'll say uh, 567, code 4. 567, code 4. He answers back. I know that one. Because uh, dispatchers check on everyone under their um, under their umbrella every, I'm going to say at least every 30 minutes is probably longer than that. <laughs> Stay in print. All right. Any other questions? I've gone way over. Yeah.